Hello, this is Philip Russell at TDWI, and uh, welcome to a TDWI webinar panel. Today, uh, we're going to be talking to a panel of experts about data management for big data, Hadoop, and data lakes. And so, uh, our, our webinar today is one hour long. And also, uh, those of you listening, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for finding time in your busy schedules to join us. And also, uh, we do want to hear your questions, and we're going to answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. So as we proceed through the webinar, please uh, look in your browser-based user interface and find the place for entering a question. That way, your questions will be queued up and ready for us to answer later. Now, for those of you who use Twitter, please use uh, our call sign on Twitter. That would be hashtag TDWI. Uh, later, after the uh, webinar concludes, it will be archived and available for playback. For those of you who registered for the uh, webinar today, we will send you an email that includes a link to the archive. So feel free to replay the webinar through the archive and also share that link. Share that link with your colleagues and encourage them to replay the uh, webinar from the archive as well. So um, today, as I said, this webinar is actually a panel. And on our panel today, we have experts from four software firms. Each representative is an expert in data management, including uses involving big data, Hadoop, and data lakes. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So to get ready for that, I'm going to lay out some basic issues and set a scene for the discussion. And then I'll introduce the panel members. And we're going to walk through three groups of questions. First of all, how is data itself evolving? We all know the size is getting larger, but there's a diversification of sources and structure and so forth. Number two, we'll talk about how is data management changing? After all, with the data changing and with what businesses want to do with data, we have to manage data differently. And so we're, many of us are revising our practices and adopting new tools and platforms. We'll also talk about how the business use of data is changing. Uh, as we diversify into more analytics, business monitoring, and business transformation. And then finally, we'll get to uh, all of your questions that you've submitted through your browser-based user interface. Well, let me just set a real quick scene here. As I mentioned, there's a lot of evolution going on right now. The data set itself is evolving as it diversifies into a multitude of different structures, from unstructured to semi-structured to fully structured, even relational sources. And data is coming from a lot more sources. I know many of you have uh, machine data coming from sensors and things like that, from uh, handheld devices, from uh, vehicles, you know, like trucks or rail cars and freight companies. And so you're getting a lot more data from a higher, highly um, uh, diverse range of sources than ever before. And so we all need to make some adjustments to the way we manage data. And so data management practices and tools are evolving accordingly. So we have uh, agile methodologies. We're doing a lot more data management on the fly uh, as we access data for the first time, and that's very different from what we did, we've done in data warehousing for years, which is to prepare data in a very time-consuming manner. So that's one of the bigger changes there. And of course, there are new platforms out there, uh, Hadoop's and Data Lakes among them, uh, where uh, we, so that you as users have more options for how you uh, collect and use data. And then finally, uh, business people themselves are getting more and more savvy about how to use data for some kind of organizational advantage or other forms of business value. We see a lot of that business value coming from analytics, but I know a lot of you are using the new data to extend your views of customers and other key business entities like partners, uh, employees, your products, and so forth. So we'll talk uh, in more detail about some of those use cases as we go. Quick word about Hadoop. Uh, you know, part of my job at TDWI is to run surveys and uh, create some fairly straightforward statistics. I have a, a, a group of survey questions I've run three times in 2012, 14, and 16. In 2016, we found that 20% of data warehouse programs surveyed had Hadoop clusters uh, in production. So notice that's only in data warehousing, not the rest of the enterprise. And note that this is Hadoop in production. These are not proof of concepts or skunk work projects. And so I'm finding Hadoop out there regularly used primarily to extend data warehouses and to provide both storage and analytic computing power for analytics uh, on the advanced side. We're also seeing uh, data lakes, uh, data archiving, 
uh, marketing data, especially monthly channel marketing, uh, a wide variety of operational data on Hadoop. And then finally, Hadoop can be physically located on premises, you know, behind the firewall in your enterprise, or it could be cloud-based, or it could be a combination of both. So we're seeing Hadoop and, and clouds coming together that way. Let me say a few words about the data lake. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> note that a data lake is not a platform you would buy from a vendor or get through open source, something like that. No, instead, the data lake is a method for organizing large volumes of data, similar to the way that you've designed databases in the past, right? You can't just start a database. You have to decide, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what kind of page sizes and your, your interfaces and uh, volumes and all kinds of things like that. So the data lake helps you create uh, structures for combining and uh, collecting data in a very large way. In data lakes today, because so much uh, machine data, other big data going in there, you have a wide, diverse range of structures and containers. By containers, I just mean different file types. And again, coming from diverse sources, like I said earlier. Now, a data lake may be built on top of Hadoop or a, relationship, or a relational database or both. You know, I think a lot of people have a knee-jerk reaction. Oh, yeah, the data lake, it's always on Hadoop. No, usually it is, but uh, that's not your only option. You also have the option of uh, uh, deploying, designing and deploying a data lake on a relational database or a combination. And, of course, uh, uh, you know, any of those combinations can involve the cloud. So the data lake captures big data, other new data from the new applications and sources I mentioned. Uh, among those include customer channels and touch points. And we do see a lot of marketers, a lot of marketing departments and corporations uh, actually standing up a data lake as well. I said I'm mostly seeing the lake in uh, warehousing, but uh, multi-channel marketing uh, is also an early adapter of the data lake. And so data lakes integrate new modern data with older traditional data, right? Again, I think a lot of people have this knee-jerk reaction. The data lake's new, so it's only about the new data. Well, it is about capturing the new data, but it also helps you uh, combine and integrate data of different vintages from a wide range of sources, both modern and traditional. And that's a good thing for analytics. It's a good thing for analytics because it enables you to make much wider analytic correlations across a wider range of data. And uh, you, you may be thinking, okay, that sounds good, but uh, why do people want to do this? Well, there is business value in embracing new data, big data, uh, going into uh, analytics more deeply, adapting Hadoop and data lakes. And uh, part of it is to uh, have a way to capture new data sources. And the real promise there is when you have new data that's new to your organization, there's always the prospect of having new insights. Uh, uh, say, for instance, your company stands up a new uh, smartphone app, well, there, well, that's going to have an obvious purpose to help your customer manage their account or something like that. But there's also a lot of data there that can be behavioral if you capture it properly and do analytics and tell you a lot about your customers. And uh, I know a lot of you are doing that uh, to extend your 360-degree views of customers, other business entities as well. Uh, as I mentioned, when you have new uh, data sources, you broaden the range of your visibility into operations, into the customer, your partners, et cetera. And so you can do correlations, mostly analytic, across this more diversified data. Uh, many of you have older applications for, say, fraud, uh, actuarial or risk calculations, uh, customer segmentation. You know, a lot of analytics like that benefits from a much larger data sample. So bringing in uh, new big data helps you extend those samples for a lot more uh, granular uh, accuracy uh, for those kinds of analytics. And uh, one of the things you should anticipate, many business people want to have self-service access to new data and do self-service uh, uh, reporting, analytics, and especially visualization with it. So as you think about how you're going to embrace this new data, don't forget, you know, at that last mile of use of the data, um, you, you probably are going to have business people who want some kind of self-service access. So you really got to give them tools that are uh, really tuned for self-service. And then finally, not all of it, but a lot of new data sources, uh, streams or comes at you very frequently. And so you have very fresh data. Maybe it's actually real-time data. And this is uh, helpful for those of you who want to do some kind of business monitoring. Maybe you want to uh, have business, uh, maybe you want to have management dashboards, and uh, those will have metrics that some managers need refreshed uh, regularly throughout the business day. And so uh, a data lake on Hadoop, uh, a relational equivalent, and so forth, uh, that's one way to capture that data 
so that you can do more frequent uh, refreshes of those sort of management-driven uh, data delivery products. Okay. Well, enough of me. Let's get to the real meat of the matter here. Uh, we're going to have some conversations with uh, uh, our panelists today, so I'm going to briefly introduce, introduce them and go right into the question. So uh, the first guy we'll hear from today will be Steve Woolidge. He's Vice President of Marketing at Arcadia Data. We also have Mark Vanderwill, Chief Technology Officer from HVR Software, Yanov Levin, CEO and founder of Panoply, and Ninshad Bardoliwali, who is Chief Product Officer at Paxauta. Okay. Today, uh, and, and Steve, uh, cue yourself up there because we're going to start with you. So uh, today I'm going to uh, get people talking about what changes are you seeing in data, what's driving the change, what can we expect from data in the future. So Steve and other panelists, you know, with these groups of questions, feel free to pick a spot and dive in. So Steve, take it away. Thanks, Philip. Hi, everyone. Uh, just quick background. I've been in this market for about 15 years at different BI vendors like Business Objects, um, Hadoop vendors, and currently at Arcadia Data. And what I've really seen in the past 15 years is that data is really becoming more dynamic in terms of how we define it. And that's causing organizations to struggle with these rigid or static data pipelines that we've had in place for a long time where you've got to change, a change to the schema for a report or something within the data warehouse could literally take six months or a million dollars of cost. And this is a real figure from a customer I had on a customer advisory board at a previous company, you know, a million dollars of cost to add a dimension to a report in six months of time is just unacceptable in a lot of the new types of applications that are trying to be built. So at the same time, we have these new formats like JSON, which allow self-description to be present in the data, and they're really designed for machine read readability at large scales. And so then to use this kind of data, an application cannot make these rigid assumptions on structure, and at the same time, it needs to be able to serve up insights from that data. So this can apply in a lot of different applications across industries like product analytics from an IoT perspective, from sensor data in the field. It could be streaming analytics from set-top boxes in an advertising context, cybersecurity and the machine logs that are out there, trade surveillance and financial services, you know, on and on and on. And at the same time, we're, we live in this on-demand world where people want access to the data in real time, in some cases before it's even landed on disk, much less one of these structured, rigid formats we've talked about. And I really see that the applications in the future of business intelligence is that we need to be able to read that stuff in real time uh, and allow people to explore it. So if you look at some of the example applications for that, you know, as an example, Arcadia Data has customers in cybersecurity, and what they're trying to do is have real-time instant response alerts go off but then give their security analysts the ability to drill down into detail across all the endpoints, the networks, and the users to see who's connected to that incident and triage it and take remedial action as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. If you think about another example might be connected cars where you've got uh, fleet managers, let's say, that want to track drivers, let's say, in a, a, a truck fleet, and they want to be alerted to an incident and then also be able to drill into the historical analysis to look at the aggression patterns of those hate, uh, of those drivers over time, or what's the weather like, you know, different trends in the uh, the road surface and things like that. So it's kind of interesting then the different types of data that are available and, and how do we unlock that. So that's my view. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks for getting us going here. Uh, Mark Vanderweel uh, from HVR. Are you seeing, seeing similar evolutions in data or what? Um, yeah. Thanks, Philip, and uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone, um, for listening in to today's webinar. Um, a little bit about my background. Uh, I've been uh, two decades in this industry by now and basically been in the, uh, in the database management arena as well as in the real-time data movement uh, space. So from that perspective, uh, Philip, um, absolutely I see some of the same trends that Steve is seeing. We absolutely see the demand for real-time um, data that's, of course, where we get involved uh, from, from HR's perspective. If I just <clears throat> quickly go through the list of questions here, what changes do I see in the data? We absolutely see uh, a significant increase in volume. Some of that is driven by IoT, but uh, some of that is also driven by unlocking data in legacy systems as well. We, we see a tendency in our customer base that um, they want to just simply add more and more data sources 
and some of those data sources are, are have been in, have been around and have been running for many years. We see um, volume uh, both from a transactional processing perspective as as well as from a from a sheer data volume perspective. And I think what's what's driving the change is simply that by now the technologies have evolved to the point that um, customers start to see how they can get the value out of the data. There's, there's, no, there's no longer technological limitations per se that would uh, artificially limit the volume of data that needs to be collected or that would artificially uh, limit the, uh, the real-time aspect of the data. We now have technologies available that even though some of those um, sources are extremely busy, we can actually capture and, and manage the data at scale, at volume. And we can start combining that to drive business value. So um, what can we expect from the data in the future? F from that angle, I think we're, we're only scratching the surface. Um, we've got several customers um, at HR who are building out their data lakes. And well, the one thing that we absolutely see uh, for all of those customers is that they continuously make changes to the environment. Uh, of course, they add sources, they add different data types, the data types that we haven't seen before, but they're also changing technologies. And uh, all of that said, uh, which you already alluded to, um, uh, Philip, earlier on, is like we see that happening on premises, we see that happening in the cloud, and we see our clients shifting from one deployment model to the other. We, it's it's really all. <laughs> It's really all over the map, and the one constant is really change here. So I expect to see a lot more of this uh, going forward. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you for those uh, excellent examples. Um, let's move on to Yonav Levin from Panoply. What kind of evolution are you seeing in the data that you deal with? Yeah, thank you, uh, Philip. So, um, A, I absolutely agree with, uh, uh, with Steve and Mark, uh, especially with what, what Mark said. Um, about um, the changes he's seeing in uh, the collection and aggregation of multiple data sources. And, um, you know, I think it's an interesting question, and, and, and the, core, the core interest about it is that, um, you know, the end result of what we're looking for um, are, are kind of like the same. I mean, they haven't changed in the course of time. Uh, I mean, in the end, um, of course, you know, new technologies and methodologies are enabling, enabling us uh, to analyze uh, new worlds. Uh, in more and more niche concepts, and I'm talking about techniques like deep learning and uh, new statistical algorithms that are being applied um, in data science. But, over, but the overall goal of what we're actually doing remains the same as it has been since kind of scientific methodologies have been uh, developed to answer questions. And um, in Panoply, we basically deal with analytical data. So the, that kind of limits us in terms of the data trends we're exposed to. So my answer will only be in regards to analytical data, uh, meaning data that is actually gathered and used for analytical purposes. So what are we seeing? Um, what we're seeing is that um, the sources of data are getting much more diverse, uh, kind of like what uh, Mark mentioned before. Um, meeting more and more companies, even smaller ones, are utilizing over a dozen different sources to gather their data, uh, which makes the ability to gather data um, into one place which makes the, the ability to gather data uh, into one place um, uh, in a fast, organized um, way, way out, a much harder task. Um, the second thing that we're seeing is that smaller and smaller companies are gathering more and more data. Uh, and they do this because gathering data in different locations and so on and so on is becoming easier and easier and the cost of storage are constantly going down. Now, cloud has kind of revolutionized the space, but uh, the thing is that most of the data is is still kind of garbage, you know, data they're, they're collecting, meaning uh, it's data that's not being used for extracting a value, and most of it will probably never be used, um, but they're still hoarding it away, uh, which is creating challenges well, in accessing the data that, is actually, that actually matters. So uh, this kind of trend that we're seeing um, is having to do to three main reasons. One, um, you know, it's easier to collect data, and it's becoming easier every day. Two, it's cheaper to store data, and it's getting cheaper to store it every day. And three, especially in new companies, um, everybody wants to be data-driven. Um, so there are a growing number of data-driven stakeholders inside the organization. And we believe that uh, we will see these trends continue to grow, especially with new uh, data-heavy verticals like IoT, which I think Steve mentioned earlier, um, different AR and VR applications. And the movement from on-premise, which I think Mark mentioned earlier, 
from on-premise to cloud, requiring ability to support at least multi-vendor architectures. Um, so that's kind of like what we're seeing. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, those are good examples as well. Uh, thanks, Yanov. Let's uh, move on to uh, Ninshad Bardolo Wali uh, from Pugzada. What kind of data evolution are you seeing out there? Thanks, thanks very much, Philip. And uh, you know, I'll just briefly introduce myself. I am the Chief Product Officer of Paxada, uh, and like the other uh, distinguished panelists, I've been in the BI and analytics space for uh, too long <laughs> uh, at companies like Siebel, Hyperion, and uh, SAP. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach uh, than, than the other folks and say that uh, I actually think what we're seeing is uh, not being data-driven, but being data-disillusioned. Uh, oh. I think that the, uh, the, data man the, the glut of data that is now available uh, is forcing us into becoming hoarders. And so uh, there is, there's no question that what, what the folks said before is absolutely true, which is that we're getting data from a whole new variety of sources. You know, we started off, uh, in the relational world, pulling lots of data from the transactional applications, uh, and then you know social media, machine data, uh, all these other sources of information uh, are coming from different places. But the fact is that what we're seeing with our customers is that they have lots of data. Um, the, the problem has shifted because of the uh, economies of scale that the data lake architecture has provided. Where they're really struggling is actually turning that data into something that's actually valuable. So a lot of our customers are telling us that, look, the problem is not getting the data in the first place. We now have solutions to that. It's actually making that data valuable and useful and exploitable uh, for, for the challenges that, that we're going through. And I think you know, what's, what's driving that change is that ultimately uh, being able to collect and store data uh, is a commodity, right? Uh, you can continue to buy, and if you look at the prices uh, that Amazon and Microsoft and, and the cloud vendors are driving from a storage perspective, uh, you're seeing that the, you know, the limit is not in how much data you can store, right? Um, but, the, but the fact is that uh, for the rate that the storage is going up, we are certainly not seeing a commensurate rate in business value uh, that's, being, uh, that's being driven from these folks. So, you know, we, we have customers like uh, some of the largest banks in the world where they, they have gone all in on the data lake architecture. They're harvesting data from, you know, literally hundreds or thousands of sources. Uh, but the fact is that all of that harvesting hasn't led uh, to, to being able to exploit that information because uh, the data isn't clean, uh, it's not complete for their purposes, it hasn't been placed in a specific context, uh, it's not really usable for their perspectives. So uh -huh. what, we be what we believe very strongly is that what we're going to expect from data in the future is that um, it's going to have to turn into, you know, we're going to have to use smarts uh, and automation to make data useful and exploitable instead of just uh, focusing on collecting it and I think that's the next order of capability that will start to drive value with our customers. And it's certainly something that we at Paxata uh, are pioneering in the market. All right. Again, very good points making there. You know, folks, uh, we're going to move on to uh, the second group of questions. And uh, this time we're going to start with uh, Mark Vanderweel. You know, Mark, in your prior comments, you mentioned that uh, uh, modern, uh, modern hardware and software servers are so much better than they were in the past, and so we can we can let go of a lot of the uh, sort of pre-prep that we did in the past, do prep on the fly, and uh, you know with that in mind, uh, what you know what kind of changes do we need to make as users in our best practices, and also in our portfolios of data platforms and tools to uh, really uh, leverage uh, not just take care of the new data, but also leverage uh, some new possibilities in the hardware and software world. Yeah, great question. Uh, great questions, Philip. <laughs> so, um, and also, I, I actually wanted to uh, go back to uh, Nanshot's comments about um, organizations simply starting to hoard data more than, mm -hmm. than driving business value out of it. I do think that, <clears throat> to my earlier comment, that uh, the data lake architectures that we're seeing, that the only constant there is change, is that's, that's really what's going on here. There is a lot of uh, data being collected um, and in an effort to drive the business value, the, there's an ongoing realization that changes need to be made in order to, to drive that business. And there, 
from that perspective, we see technology changes, and that's where we see, um, in some environments, we see limitations of of the, the the more traditional relational technologies, and we see a lot more organizations, a lot more of our customers, uh, shifting to file-based uh, systems from a management perspective. Again, to Nanshat's earlier point, that some of that is, is simply driven by a cost uh, argument, um, but it's also, I think, from a from a volume and scale perspective, mm-hmm. it's a it's a change that we're seeing in this environment. And um, <clears throat> but then at the same time, as we're seeing the customers adopting those uh, new data platforms, we see that they're um, in at least in the early phases they're struggling with. Um, ironically, the traditional transactional processing applications because the data from those systems is unlike IoT data, which kind of, kind of comes in as a stream of data, of a, a set of measurements in, in many cases. In contrast to that kind of data, the traditional transactional applications process inserts, updates, and, uh, well, <laughs> deletes as well. And uh, organizations are uh, initially at least struggling to make sense out of the data and then also to, to the earlier points that were made about data quality is the, the challenge to validate that data and make sure that, well, data quality is, of course, one aspect is, is what's the quality of the data on the source and to the earlier points about data warehousing, cleansing data, etc. But it's not just the point of cleansing the data and the master data management aspect of it, just the, the sheer challenge of dealing with, um, well, is the data on the destination the same as in the source? So what types of tools and platforms are they turning to? Um, HDFS, of course, Hadoop, one of them. And Philip, you showed that in your as the survey results, but also S3 and some of the other cloud vendors, um, uh, uh, bulk storage platforms as well. Those are tools. Kafka comes up a lot. So um, from that perspective, that's absolutely what I'm seeing. So over to you, Philip. Uh, well, thank you, Mark. And uh, gentlemen, I need to ask you to be more concise in your answers. But let's move on to Yanov. Uh, what are you seeing uh, in this area? Yeah, so in terms of uh, in terms of changes uh, users are making uh, to their data, uh, there's definitely more awareness of being data-driven. Uh, and therefore, the way data is stored in production service today is much more oriented towards uh, their data architecture than it was, let's say, uh, a decade ago. Um, also because some of the trends uh, I mentioned, like in the past, in the, in the, earlier, um, the earlier question. Now, um, you take that awareness and turn it into the data or analytical infrastructure, there's still a great gap. Um, when companies uh, build their proprietary data infrastructure, uh, initially it's, it's really cool just because the technologies are awesome um, and, they, and they're becoming faster and, and, you know, and, and more challenges are being solved in you know, much cooler ways, uh, like the technologies that, that um, you know, Mark just mentioned. Um, what they don't realize is that data infrastructure is a profession itself. And it starts off really cool, but then becomes a nightmare to maintain and scale. So, um, we're definitely seeing more and more companies, especially the smaller and techier ones, um, turning into um, self-managed platforms, um, uh, you know, like Panoply, the, like self-managed, self-optimizing platforms. In fact, um, in, a, in a survey that we published um, on our site um, of 900 data professionals, and I've seen similar surveys also in Gartner's latest, uh, latest reports, um, you know, complexity was by far the highest challenge com- companies are facing today. Um, so just like, um, just like enterprises are just now realizing the power of the cloud and there is a huge wave of companies migrating to cloud infrastructure or at least some sort of hybrid infrastructure, um, the companies that are more in the forefront of data technologies um, are now beginning to offload these challenges to self-optimizing and self-managed platforms. Um, and this is just you know, for the sake of, of, of time and focus and, and cost optimization. So, okay, very good. Sense. Yeah. Yana, those are all very good points. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's just move straight on to Ninjog. What are you seeing in uh, changes around practices and tools? Sure. Uh, happy to answer that, Philip. So the, the first thing uh, that we have to ask is, who is the user who is part of, of the data management practices? Um, I think we've seen over the last decade or so that there is sort of this inexorable push towards democratizing uh, information across you know, not just the data scientist community, not just the developer and engineer community, 
but really moving beyond uh, towards the, the average business user inside of an organization. Uh, frankly, most of those folks have been uh, using tools like Excel and Access. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, uh, writing VLOOKUPs and uh, macros and uh, pivot tables to be able to manage their data, uh, but not really having tools or capabilities to do this kind of work. And so the, the big change that we see happening is that on the one hand, the, the end users have really adopted self-service tools like Tableau and Click and others. Uh, and on the other hand, their IT colleagues are working with data management infrastructure that's allowing for the persistence and management of polystructured data, JSON, uh, relational tables, graph, and so on. Uh, but there haven't been tools and capabilities that allow you to bridge the gap between those two, especially yeah. for the business business people. And so uh, what we're seeing, and certainly the, the change that we're driving in the market, uh, is, is to look at opportunities to provide uh, self-service mechanisms where mm -hmm. broader groups of people can actually leverage the data that's being collected uh, and yeah. give them the capability to turn that raw data into useful information. And I think that's where the value extraction lies, and that's certainly where we see our customers benefiting from our technology. Yeah, I have to agree with you. Those are all excellent points. And uh, uh, I mentioned this earlier uh, to the audience. As you collect new data, you should anticipate that a wider range of users are going to want to access it. We see a lot of marketers. That's the hot spot I see right now. But you see a lot of uh, uh, broadening business people who want some sort of self-service data access as well as related self-service functions in uh, reporting analytics and visualization. Uh, let's move on to Steve. Um, you know, Steve, I know you have strong interests in uh, things like real-time and cloud. Are, are things like that affecting uh, best practices and uh, tool portfolios? Yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd echo a lot of what Nenshad was also saying just now, which is that the democratization of the access to the data and the challenge I think we face is if you look at the new types of data that come in, these, these structured tools, as Nenshaw was pointing out, don't handle them really well. In a lot of cases, people don't know the questions to even ask of the data yet. So I think people, as they yeah. move towards the cloud or things like Hadoop, you know, how can we allow them to discover and explore within mm -hmm. these data lakes? And I think the challenge we face as an industry is that we kind of fall into our old ways of doing things. And if you take yeah. Tableau or Click and try and connect that up to one of these data lakes, it, it just doesn't scale. It's, it's it's pulling data out, or it has to aggregate that data to pull it out, so you kind of lose all the granularity and fidelity of that data. So there's this whole new generation of technologies I like to call native or data native uh, BI tools or visual analytics that allow you to run the analytic processing, as was promised, directly by the data within the platform itself, and that gives people incredibly fast access to the data as long as they can access it in its sort of native format, like I was talking about earlier with JSON and other types of things, but also join it with relational uh, other NoSQL things like solar indexes or real-time sources like Kafka and others. So I think that's the challenge that we face, and I think it's you can't fall into the old ways. You've got to move the processing to the data, run the BI tools in the platforms themselves, which is available now because of the more open standards that things like Hadoop have promulgated out of the industry. So. Yeah, excellent, and uh, I'm glad you brought up uh, data exploration and discovery. Uh, uh, just to get a grip on what the new data is, what's the content in terms of business entities that uh, we want to study, and also what's the technical condition of it from a schema or a data quality viewpoint uh, involves a lot of data exploration and discovery. So that's another thing people listening to the webinar should anticipate as a requirement. Um, <clears throat> let's move on to uh, group number three of questions. We're doing well so far. So uh, this time we're going to start off with Yanov. So Yanov, uh, this is where we shift over, and I know we've touched on business value, but here's where we really dig into business value. And this is where the rubber hits the road. It's, it's time-consuming, expensive to, uh, you know, uh, adapt and uh, expand uh, data management, uh, grab the new data. But, you know, I think it's worthwhile. Uh, wh where do you think the business value is in dealing with new and big data? Right. So, um, well, you know, the, the answer to, to a question like this is, is basically in the numbers. Um, you, you look at companies like, like Ford, Kimberly Clark, uh, Target, you know, they've done amazing things. Um, you know, and everybody can read about this online, you know, how Ford turned a $12 billion loss into a profit in less than three years, all using data science. And Kimberly Clark, 
um, you know, they're massive, massive amount of clients. They have like over a billion clients in 80 different countries, the dozens of brands and so on across like multiple mobile, social, web, and, uh, uh, platforms and so on. And how they utilize big data, everything from customer to retail level to inventory to improve stock forecasts and target, uh, you know, just a retail company uh, being one of the uh, largest employers or data scientists in the United States. Um, and, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's a known fact today that 80% of the data collected is not being utilized for analytics or actually extracting value. Now, that doesn't mean that um, that doesn't mean that, um, that there's actually 80% more value inside the data that is not being uh, analyzed, but uh, there's still there, there's definitely uh, there's definitely a big chunk of data um, that uh, the, the companies can still utilize for extracting more value. Um, and, and, you know, today, the, the people that are actually extracting the value are spending approximately 80% of their time on prepping the data um, and the infrastructure. Now, once these organizations move to newer, uh, to newer uh, more uh, simple uh, and sophisticated platforms, that will basically offload all those inefficiencies uh, from the data scientists, from the, extract, the actual extractors of the value, and these, these scientists will be able to, you know, be, you know, three, four, five times more efficient in extracting that, that value. Yeah, very good examples. Thank you for some industry-specific examples, too. Uh, let's move on to Ninshad. Uh, where are some areas where you see companies getting real business value from new big data? Sure. So uh, the, first, the first thing is, you know, how do we, how do we quantify value, right? And I, I like, I'm from New Jersey, so I like to keep things really uh -huh. simple. <laughs> Either you're making a company money, you're saving them costs, or you're keeping them out of jail. So your use cases <laughs> have to, have to tie, tie to those things, right? So we, we see, and again, with this general approach of folks, and, and uh, the, the gentleman right before me referred to this, you know, 80% of the time that people spend in analytics projects uh, is actually on the data preparation process, right? And so if you can find new ways to actually be able to uh, allow people to interactively transform data uh, and, and basically flip the equation, right? What if we could spend 80% of our time on the value generation instead of scrubbing and cleaning and all the other things we enjoy doing? So what, what we have seen is, uh, Philip, and is some very dramatic returns on the ability to work with, with big data. Uh, one of our, our largest customers in financial services, uh, they had over a billion dollars in fines over the last five years uh, due to regulatory compliance challenges. And uh, every additional regulatory report, because of the data preparation process, uh, took them 22 days to implement. Uh, but going with a self-service approach where actually business users, the ones who had the domain knowledge, were able to prep the data themselves, Still with full governance from the IT teams, we were able to take that 22-day process and turn it into a one-day process. So that's an example on the compliance side. On the customer side, uh, we're seeing some of our customers who are looking at initiatives like single view of the customer. And again, they're pulling data from multiple different data sources, including web logs, uh, including the, the classic call center information uh, and the like. And uh, the ability to take that data and very rapidly consolidate it, deduplicate it, aggregate it to make it useful for analytics uh, allows them to make very quick decisions about additional offers that they want to provide those customers, uh, additional ways that they can increase the customer satisfaction, et cetera. So, you know, in, in summary, I think that whether it's, you know, reducing costs or increasing value uh, or keeping people uh, in compliance, that there are, you know, we have seen the power of self-service information management uh, to really drive that value across all three of those dimensions in our 60-plus customers. Wow, again, really excellent examples. Uh, Ninja, I'm just going to restate some of what you said, but I'm going to put it in TDWI terms just to uh, help communicate with our audience as well, uh, which is that uh, just because data is coming from a source that's new to you, just because you're in phase zero of even capturing it and figuring out what the heck is there uh, does not mean that you are exempt from data governance. Uh, 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 I mentioned that a lot of this new data is coming from uh, new customer channels. Well, customer data inherently is subject to your data privacy policy. So you need, to, you need to think about that from the beginning as you're adapting new data from new sources. And likewise, uh, I mentioned when I was talking to Steve earlier about data exploration and discovery. So when you're uh, exploring data, uh, and also I see unprecedented levels of data profiling, which is what you have to do when you have new sources, right? 
So in the data exploration and profiling stages, you know, be thinking about the uh, data governance uh, impl impl implications of it. And then also uh, when you're doing data profiling, you're looking at the technical state of data. And for a lot of people, uh, enterprise standards are regulated through their data governance board. So great, great points there. Uh, speaking of Steve, uh, Steve, it's uh, your turn. What are you seeing for business value? Sure. I mean, there's, you know, in this industry, there's hundreds of use cases across all kinds of industries, I think, that mm -hmm. um, then Sean gave some great examples. I'll give one around financial services in a minute, but one that is kind of interesting is Procter & Gamble, uh, who's been a customer of Arcadia Data for a while. And they had a top-down initiative to really look at how to leverage this new data that's out there from social media, weather. Uh, they had over 25 different data sets, so they created a data lake. And they wanted to provide the product managers at P&G ways to analyze over 600 brands globally to measure the impact of marketing campaigns and weather and other things that drive sales and uh, velocity of the products through the retailers and use that as a service back to the retailers to help them sort of plan with inventory, supply chain, manufacturing of the products to improve that process overall. So. With Arcadia Data and Hadoop, they created this data lake that combined all that information. And the problem they had initially was they were struggling because there was no self-service tool, which we were talking about earlier, that could allow them to really give the, the product managers a way to drill down to detail and go from country to state to city to individual stores and look at velocity of products and those types of things until they were able to run the analytics directly inside the data lake where it could access all that scale at once. So it's that native approach that we're seeing within these scale-out architectures from an analytics perspective that really empower the business to do something uh -huh. interesting with the data. So that's one example. And then a quick one is uh, Royal Bank of Canada in a similar context around um, you know, avoiding fines and regulations and those types of things. They were communic uh, combining communication channels like chat logs, text, messages and actual trades to assess whether they're compliant with the regulations. And they're quite literally trying to reconstruct the view of the world at the time that a certain trade is executed by a trader. And this allows them to assess whether there was any kind of a violation, catch and rectify those violations before the regulatory authorities get involved. And this mm -hmm. allows the desks to avoid these hefty fines, which can really impact the bottom line if you think about the types of uh, dollars we're talking about here. So lots of different applications. Those are a couple. Well, Steve, those are great examples. Uh, you know, with Procter & Gamble, they were one of the first companies to uh, really define modern marketing, and they started doing that about 150 years ago. So I'm really glad uh, to see that Procter & Gamble is still being very innovative with marketing. And, in fact, uh, in a related area, um, uh, you know, I recently did this big study on data lakes, had a big survey. I found a lot of data lakes being used in data warehouse environments, but the number two environment was what I'm now calling the marketing data lake. And again, big companies with lots of multi-channel data uh, are standing up data lakes, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear one at P&G. And you mentioned Royal Bank of Canada. We've actually had them, uh, RBC, we've had them speak at TDWI conferences. About 10 years ago, they were the first people to stand up and talk about their cloud implementation. Imagine doing, uh, you know, something as sensitive as financial data onto the cloud, and Royal Bank of Canada was a real leader there. So. Uh, you know, pat yourself on the back. You get to work with some of the real leading companies here. That's great. Uh, let's, move on. let's move on to uh, Mark Vanda, Will, from uh, HVR Software. What kind of business value are you seeing out there from new big data? Yeah, so the, uh, I think the a premier example that I, can, um, that, that I can bring to the table here, um, there have indeed been a lot of examples already, but we've been working with a, a global manufacturer. And uh, I remember some of the early conversations four or five years ago when the discussion was more about, okay, we've got all this IoT data from the equipment that we're manufacturing. How can we store this data? And this was four or five years ago. That problem has long been solved. And since then, a lot of the operational data has been added to the system. And now <laughs> this global manufacturer has started a new offering not unlike the use case we heard from Steve about Procter & Gamble, where some of their customers are now um, purchasing new services from the organization to make sense of the analytics of the equipment that they've purchased from this organization. Now, that is predominantly an analytical play, so there's lots of analysis happening, 
But the next phase of this data lake and this data collection and uh, analytics initiative is to feed all that information back into operations. Because if you are in global manufacturing and you've got all the, this equipment out there, you can start helping your customers be more efficient, make sure you prevent outages and you, you do preventative maintenance by combining some of that sensor-generated data with the traditional ERP data to optimize your manu manufacturing processes to be able to increase the uptime of your equipment. So with that, generating more value for your customers. <clears throat> so uh, I think really what we're seeing is big data, how is that going to transform the business? On the one hand, it's going to improve customer satisfaction. It's going to uh, well, <laughs> lower the odds that the organization ends up in jail. But then uh, at the same time, it's going to create um, uh, new business opportunities as well. There's going to be lines of offerings from organizations that are driven by the data collection and the services driven from that. So that's, I think, where this is going. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And, uh, you know, you were talking about the Internet of Things. At TDWI, uh, we, I think we all know that things get hyped when they're new, but at TDWI we've been surprised that IoT has come out of hype pretty early. Uh, in fact, mainly the industrial side, not so much the consumer side. So, uh, yeah, I'm totally on the same page with you there. We're seeing a lot of real-world action going on in there with our members, especially those who have different uh, kind of logistics uh, places where there's more sensors and machine data on vehicles, rail cars, shipping pallets, and so forth, especially mobile devices. All right. Thank you, Mark, for that. Well, folks, uh, those of you in the audience, uh, thank you for sending in some questions, and let's get going here. Uh, Ninshot, I think I've found a good question for you here, so let's start with you. So, Ninshot, I have a question here uh, from Carla, and Carla says, I would like to know what type of tools do you use or recommend to keep track of metadata, data quality, and business rules? Sure. I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer that. So I think there are uh, – the, the first thing you have to understand in that process is what types of data uh, and what types of people want to be able to work with, with uh, that metadata, that information. Um, there are, I think, a number of very good tools on the market um, you know, from the IT side uh, of, of the house which handle metadata uh, for, you know, pulling information from various different sources, stitching them together, being able to work with ER diagrams and whatnot. Um, but I think the, what, what we're seeing is sort of a broader trend is that those, those capabilities need to be able to brought out, be brought out not only to the IT teams but to the business. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think not only some of the other folks on, on this call, the other vendors as well, but uh, in Paxata's case, we actually uh, have metadata man management facilities as part of a broader system that integrates data quality, data profiling, data integration, et cetera. So it really depends on is this a dedicated capability that I want as kind of a hub or is it something that I want to embed as part of a broader suite of information mm -hmm. management tools? Yeah, let me get your feedback on something, Ninshad. Um, uh, you know, I'm hearing from a lot of our members who have to teach guy that business people want more self-service. You talked about this yourself earlier. And uh, I, I think there are two things people really need for self-service, uh, you know, besides the data. Uh, I think they need business metadata, not just technical. Uh, and the business metadata might be a full-blown business uh, glossary. And I think they need the, just the right end-user tools, end -user tools that are high use of use. But, so what do you think of that? Uh, how, how critical is business metadata or some kind of business glossary to self-service? I think it's absolutely critical, Philip. Uh, you know, the, the, the way that we look at the market, there are capabilities that you need for understanding what data that you have, right? And, and yep. knowing that uh, these are the data sources, uh, these are the different data structures that are inside those data sources, this is the kind of data that's in there, whether it's PII or, or, or other important information. Uh, and then there's the ability to actually manipulate that, that data. And I think that um, the, the only way that we can get value from data is to provide as much context as, as possible when you're actually working with that data. And so uh, we have started working with a number of the cataloging vendors to actually embed uh, the, the business glossary type information at the point of data transformation so that the end users actually have the context of, 
What does this field mean? What are the rules around it? What are the source systems it comes from? And they can leverage that knowledge uh, to then sculpt the information into something useful for an analytic use case, for example. Okay, that's great. Well, hey, listen, uh, Steve Woolage, uh, perk up, because I've got a question for you. Now, listen, uh, Steve, we have a, a question from Carlos, and Carlos is asking, uh, what is the Hadoop or Spark trend for companies to use? So, Steve, I'm giving this to you because I know you've spent a lot of time with Hadoop and Spark. Yeah, I think what's interesting about Hadoop is there's a lot of, you know, headlines out there about, you know, Hadoop has lost its, you know, excitement or whatever, but if you look at the data from a survey, I looked at one from uh, September of last year from Gartner, there's actually 72% of organizations from the survey had either implemented Hadoop already or were planning to implement within the next six months or something like that. So yeah. you know, three quarters of companies are using it. Now, having said that, Spark is absolutely the most popular uh, trending processing engine that's out there in the open source community. So that replaces, in many ways, the MapReduce jobs, which a lot of people are running on Hadoop, which will still mm -hmm. be in place for, you know, Hive and other batch types of workloads. But, you know, Spark gives you that more in-memory capability and different types of data pipeline, not just uh, right. MapReduce itself, but, you know, machine learning, SQL, and that kind of thing. So definitely the Spark is a hot trend, but it needs to have a, a storage platform as well. And Hadoop is, I think, still by far the most popular storage platform if you, you know, Hadoop meaning HDFS and HDFS API compliant variants, um, et cetera. So I don't know if, what trends he was looking for, but at a high level is what I'm seeing around Hadoop and Spark. Yeah, those are great, those are great examples. Now, listen, Steve, I know you've also worked with um, uh, some of the query tools around Hadoop, uh, in particular Drizzle, right? And uh, you mentioned Spark, and Spark does have a library for uh, ANSI standard SQL, which is all about query. Can, can you just like compare those two so the uh, listeners have, you know, you know, when would they use one of those over the other? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think there's lots of, you know, SQL variants and tools and projects out mm -hmm. there. I think the most popular in order, if I remember correctly, are Hive, Impala, Spark SQL's right in there, Apache Drill is really close, you know, there's Presto and all these others out there. And I think at a high level, if you want big jobs, um, very reliable that are leveraging the MapReduce framework, Hive is a great engine for that. And it's not just querying, but also um, data transformation in some cases. But again, these are kind of raw tools, right? There's no visual interface on top of a lot of these things, yeah. which I think is the gap that Arcadia Data is um, filling. Uh, but then there's, you know, Impala does it's similar to Drill in that it, it leverages memory and it's faster. It's more of an interactive analytics, and I'd say Spark SQL maybe is similar to that, but from my recent memory, I don't think Spark SQL is quite as mature yet in terms of all the ANSI variants and, you know, specific functions that are supported. So I think it's, you know, all these tools are going to evolve, and I, I think somebody said once it takes you seven years to really, you know, develop a, a strong database and all the the maturity around the SQL optimizers and those types of things. So it'll, there's a lot of different things out there, and I think it depends mm -hmm. on, you know, what distro you're using, what are the data formats you've got, um, what what tools you want to connect. And I think, yeah, I mean, I can go on forever, but I think uh, yeah. there's lots of choices. Yeah, good. Those are good details. Thank you for that. Hey, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Vanderweel from HVR Software. I've got a question for you here. Here we go. Uh, Dimitrina. Dimitrina asks, where do you fit data scientist into – let me try that again. Where do you fit data science into what you're talking about? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and I think there's, there's two aspects to, um, to, to address that question. On the one hand, I think the, the data science really comes after the data collection. So once the data is available – for a um, in a central data store where there is the ability to start combining the data with other with data from other sources, whether it's IoT, whether it's traditional applications, whether it's a legacy system that was brought into the data lake. That's absolutely where a lot of the data science fits, where there is the data volume available at scale. But then at the same time, we see um, a demand for data science on streaming data as well, where we're really driving towards um, an, an environment um, where the, uh, the latency between 
the data originating and then having access to it from a data science perspective, we're, we're driving down that latency to zero uh, as much as we can. So that's where the, <coughs> there's a bit of a trade-off, and I think it really depends on the use case. It really depends to a certain degree on the industry. But at the end of the day, it, it comes down to what's the business value and where does the data science fit in um, from from that perspective as to where, where it applies most. Okay, excellent. Great question. Well, I'll tell you what, we have time for uh, one more question here. Um, uh, Yanov, Yanov Levin from uh, Panoply. Uh, I think I've got a good question for you. You ready? So uh, uh, Let's try. Okay, so Aaron asks, uh, what would be the best data preparation tool? And, uh, uh, you know, d d you know, don't necessarily give him the name of your company, but uh, you know, tell him uh, what 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 should you look for in a data preparation tool? Because you know, the data preparation tools typically do go with do uh, new data uh, as you're exploring it, uh, and also uh, even with data lakes, if people are exploring through a data lake. So anywhere you want to jump in there, but I'm hoping you'll tell us what do you what should we look for in a good data preparation tool? Yeah, so um, it's a good question because, um, and I'll tell you why it's a good question, because the whole philosophy around uh, data preparation tools um, is a philosophy that, you know, we at Panoply, we generally don't, um, you know, we generally do not, um, um, we do not believe it, even though uh, I think that, uh, you know, Pixada here uh, could answer that question probably better. Um, and, you know, Platform is a great tool and so on. Um, there are many, many great tools. Uh, but I'll tell you a bit about um, about our philosophy in terms of data preparation. There are, uh, you know, basically data preparation, the way we see it, uh, it you know, it's a never-ending task. It's, uh, um, it begins with um, the uh, extraction of the data, right? Extraction, the ETL, basically the ETL or ELT process um, of the data um, from the production servers or your APIs or whatever to uh, your data infrastructure. Um, it continues inside the data infrastructure because inside the data infrastructure, you still have to take care of the data. You got to take care of, uh, you know, build your, um, uh, you know, maintain your schemas. Um, make sure your data is stored in the right storage compartments and so on. And then it actually continues um, until the, the actual extraction of the data where the optimization of queries and optimization of your, of your, um, of your schema happens. This ha happens, go, goes on in a continuous, in a continuous manner. Um, we think that the main challenge there is that um, the actual extractor of the value, being the data scientist, um, is not the stakeholder in the data preparation, in the data preparation phase. The data preparation phase, the actual stakeholder is the data engineer or DBA or assistant or whatever. Um, once you have, once these two parts are differentiated, that makes, that, that basically makes a big problem in terms of your scalability of your infrastructure and scalability of your processes. And that's where we get to these processes where it takes six months to get data ready uh, for actual analysis. So uh -huh. um, in Panoply, we solve this challenge with machine learning algorithms. And that's why inside Panoply, there is no data preparation. The machine right. learning algorithms basically understand uh -huh. the data, understand the data logic, and then do all the data preparation for you. Um, that being said, there are a lot of great tools um, for ETLing, ELTing, process, ELTing processes. We mentioned some of them. Talent is a great one. Um, we work with our partners at Stitch, which are which are uh, uh, great data preparation tools. Um, Alumar, another great tool. There are many, many great tools inside this space for data preparation, especially around the ETL and ELP processes. Um, that being said, I truly believe that it's not a scalable process. Um, mm -hmm. If your company really wants to scale, and in three, four, five years from now, I don't think anybody will be doing it the same way they're doing it today. I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was a pretty good rundown, and uh, I agree that in a few years, it's just going to get even more different. 
I also like one of your insights that uh, data preparation is really useful for uh, set-based operations like query. For the kind of machine learning that you work with quite a lot, it's uh, probably not a requirement. So uh, thank you. That's a, that's a very good insight. Well, listen, folks, uh, let me uh, round up here. I want to thank everybody for attending today. You've been listening to us talk about uh, the evolution of data, its management, its business uses. And uh, we've covered a lot of ground here. We've talked about a lot of stuff. And also, <clears throat> we heard from a lot of people here. So I want to thank the panelists, including Steve Woolidge uh, from Arcadia Data, Mark Vandewill from HVR Software, Jan of Levin from Panoply, and Ninshad Bardoliwala from uh, Puxada. So uh, thank you, panelists. Thanks, for everybody, for attending. And I wish everyone a wonderful day. Uh, this concludes today's TDWI webinar on data management for Big Data, Hadoop, and Data Lakes. Goodbye.